Um, so good evening, everybody, um, and thank you for your continued interest in Summerhill College. Uh, it's a great testament uh, to the time that you spent here uh, or the connection that you have with the place, regardless of which decade, the friends you've made, the memories uh, you hold there, and of course, the education that you received. Over the past 12 months, with your involvement, our engagement with alumni has gone from strength to strength. The Alumni Association membership is continuing to grow. We have over 70 alumni mentors who are giving generously to help realize our ambitious plans and also to work with our TY students on the mentoring program. And tonight, we are hosting the third in our alumni series, Realizing Our Potential. Summerhill has continued to thrive during the pandemic, and I wanted to share some highlights with you before we start our session. Since the start of the school year, we have resumed classes as normal, well, as normal as possible. I'm extremely proud of the uh, 1,000 plus students, all of our staff, and the many families that call Summerhill home for these crucial and critical formative years. Across the school, from academic to sports, extracurricular activities, the boys are doing your alma mater proud. We hosted our annual award ceremony yesterday, and we're delighted to have Dr. Colin Kill Caulfield from the class of 1984, who is the professor of environmental and industrial fuel fluid dynamics and the head of the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics from the Cambridge or University of Cambridge join us. The event celebrated the many achievements of the school community during the academic year 2019-2020. So far this year, we are delighted that our TYE Pass class represented Ireland at the re recent Euro Schola online summit in Strasbourg. Brian Cullinan in first year qualified for the All Ireland 60 meter hurling, hurdles, long jump, shot put, and 800 meters, which are set to take place in Athlone in December. Our surfing and sailing clubs have commenced activity since September with Oscar Chu winning the under 14 national surfing, surfing title in Ross Nowla at the beginning of October. The senior soccer team overcame Ballyhonas Community School in the first round of the Connacht Cup. Our art students have had an exhibition of their work in the Yates building over the last two weeks. This afforded them a wonderful opportunity for them to showcase their talents to the local community. Our student council have had their annual elections and recently held their biannual student congress, which had a guest speaker, Mr. Ray McSharry, former EU commissioner, um, attend and, and speak. The congress sees over 60 students who were voted representatives from the student body. And during that congress, they devised a plan of action and improvements for the next three years, which are in line with our newly launched strategic plan. We want to provide the best teaching and learning environment for this and for future generations. Our ambitious plans for the campus development will facilitate this. In the coming months, I look forward to sharing additional details with you and hopefully gaining your support. This evening's panel reflects all that is great about Summerhill and why it is so distinctive. The success of our past pupils, the geographical reach of them, and their wonderful affinity to the school. Tommy Gorman will lead the session and fully introduce the group. But before that, I would like first to hear and introduce our head prefect, Mr. Eamon Feely. Apologies about that, some technical difficulties. We'll try and play it maybe towards the end. Um, we'd like, we welcome uh, the opportunity as well for people to um, ask questions um, throughout uh, the, the, the session this evening. Um, and you will be able to ask questions via the chat function, uh, which I will uh, type into once we commence. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to uh, Mr. Tommy Gorman. Go be with the misters. Where did that come from? Hello there. <laughs> I know we've got a, an audience in different parts of the world. I know we've got different generations and we hope we're gonna have a great session with you this evening. Um, when I was in first year in Summerhill, the Dean was a man called Noel Durr, he was a priest. 
he came back from Texas and he brought with him a small Sony tape recorder. And in our civics class one day, he came in and he asked us to record 30 seconds about each other. Uh, and then he played back the tape and you heard your own voice. Uh, and I suppose that was the first form of training in voice projection uh, that I got. It was the beginning of my career in media. Um, and I, I always remember that day. So I'm going to try to put some of those skills to use with you and share them with you over the next hour or so. And we've gathered a motley crew and they're the real stars of tonight's session. They're also going to be the people who are going to put on the spot to ask them about their lives, their times in Summerhill, how it influenced them, and maybe some of the lessons they can pass on to you. So I'm going to start uh, in this rogues gallery. I'm going to start down there in the bottom corner. The fellow who was yawning uh, and picking his nose during some of uh, the remarks by Paul Kyo, that's Frank Gannon. He's now in his 70s, believe it or not. Uh, I always say he looks like Donald Sutherland. He, he's a brother of Joe Gannon, of Gilroy and Gannon. His father was a former mayor of Sligo. Uh, his mother was a great woman too, went across and inspected the first digs he was going to have in UCG a big influence on his life. Uh, she has current relations in Sligo to this day. So Frank is uh, not retired. He's retired from his last job in Australia. But he's still involved in so many projects. One of the things he did in the course of his life was he was head of Science Foundation Ireland for a period. Uh, one of the reasons I know him is he's the guy who got me the advice that got me out of a real hole with my cancer condition. And in some respects, I owe my life to him. So it's nice to welcome him. So let's move up into the top right hand corner. That's Phelan McNeila. Phelan was a boarder during some of my times in Summerhill. I was in Summerhill from 69 to 75. I did the Leaving Cert twice. That's how much I like the place. The results helped me get back the second year. So Phelan was a boarder. Uh, and in his life, <laughs> he has become a very able entrepreneur, uh, made uh, a major impression on industry in the Northwest and became uh, an international company. Uh, and he has always maintained his roots with the Northwest. And in fact, he's coming to, Frank is in Australia, Phelan is in Ballinode in Sligo. So let's move down to Gary McSharry down there. He's a real McSharry, he's a poser. Uh, he's involved in the legal business. And that map you can see behind him suggesting that he's in Boston or New York, that's part of the McSharry paraphernalia. In fact, he's coming to you tonight live from Dublin. But because he does a lot of international business for the legal firm he represents, so he just wants to show his international credentials. And he's probably claiming a tax rebate on the fact of this international activity. So the fellow in the middle there, that's Cormac Cairns. Uh, and he is a financial controller involved in a company that is located outside of Carrick and Shannon in County Leitrim, but has an international profile. And he's such a nice guy um, because he's steeped in the Summerhill traditions. Several of his brothers that come from Suey, but several of his brothers were boarders in Summerhill. And from the last right down the line, the very first born, the whole way down the line of boys, they all went and they boarded in Summerhill. And when we were getting ready for this warm up session, he said, let's try and put a bit of realism and a bit of humor into the introductions. So he said to me, told a great story about, he's the fellow who missed a goal in an All-Ireland final. Uh, and he said he also scored a point in that game, but he said a fella came delivering a package to him once from a courier company. And he looked at him and he says, are you the guy who missed the goal? Um, so that's how modest a fella is that he tells a story like that against himself. <laughs> so look, we're going to have some crack tonight. We're going to try and capture the essence, the value and the future of Summerhill. And Frank, I'm going to start with you because you're the furthest away in Australia. Uh, and you're the oldest uh, by a distance. Um, do the memories still hang in there for you? And if so, what is your sense of Summer Hill and the influence it had on you? Uh, hi, everybody. So, yes, the memories.
Have you frozen on us, Frank? You want to go again? I have to refresh. Okay, we'll get you to refresh, and I'll ask the very same question to you, Phelan. Um, in terms of... You, you were well, there. Okay, oh, Frank, back. you want to have a go again, Frank? Are you refreshed? Do you want to have a cut again, please? <laughs> Okay, thanks. I'm my, in my, it's a long piece of wire to get from here to Sligo, I'm afraid, but uh, I'll, I'll keep putting the, the shillings in and it might work. Um, so I, I was, those are the years in, in secondary school when you, when you form your character and when you, when you become what you are going to be for the rest of your life. Um, so they're, they're crucial and I often think back on them. I'm sure I'm, I'm the product of, of that time in particular. Um, what do I remember completely, particularly about it? Uh, unusually, I remember the divide between the borders and the, and the day boys. Like uh, there were two different communities. And I think um, a town and country was part of that. Sligo and Roscommon was part of that. And I suppose that taught me about diversity. And that, that has helped me ever since in every other situation I've been in to do that. So that was one aspect. The other thing I'd say is that um, I was able to be completely myself and to develop myself. Uh, there was, uh, to put it in, in one context, I was a very uh, nubile female lead in the operettas. I was uh, the, the lead soprano. Uh, and you can imagine that that could, in those days, have attracted uh, all sorts of comments or more. Not a bit of it. It was, it was, uh, there, was there was nobody who was in any, in, in any way uh, thinking that it was unusual that uh, a guy with a high voice uh, would be a fellow be playing football in the back alley afterwards. Um, I just stopped there because I know you want to keep around and the others may have uh, ideas to add to it and my shitting might run out. Uh, Willem, do you think that you were shaped by, by those years in Summerhill? Uh, how do you look back on it now? You know, because you've had a an outstandingly successful uh, career as an entrepreneur. So how big an influence was Summerhill or did it come in university or in later life? It's, it's a hard one, all right, Tommy, in that um, you don't know in, in relation to things like leadership, are they, are they are you born with it or, or do you develop it later in life and that. But I suppose the thing about Summerhill that always stuck out for me when I was there um, and, and just listening to Paul talking about the successes that some of the students are enjoying at the moment, it was the fact that it was, it always seemed to be that little bit different from the standard secondary school. It was a progressive place under Tommy Finnegan in particular, who I know you remember, um, and very tolerant. And I think that gave us all, or certainly gave me, um, a broader perspective on the world and encouraged you, I think, to, to, to see that and, and to think for yourself. And I think that generated then uh, an ambition and a confidence to go on after Summerhill and to pursue whatever course of, of activity uh, you wanted to do at university or uh, at work, whatever it was. I think because of that progressivity, the, the, the tolerance, the cosmopolitan nature of the place, um, which must have been there, it was there in my time and it seems to be there at the moment. I think that generated that, um, that uh, sense of ambition and that sense that you could go out into the world and basically do whatever it was that you set your mind to do. I think it, it, it certainly gave me that confidence anyway. Gary, you go in there uh, uh, as a, a chaw, uh, as the first year, and okay, you've made your transition from national school and suddenly you're in this place, everyone has long trousers, fellas are beginning to start growing their first facial hair and so on. How did you find it? Um, as you were from Sligo, so you were a day boy, right? Gary? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what was it like? Just tell me, you know, going in for you, how, how did the place start to make an impression on you? Yeah, it was certainly a, a big transition when I look back on it now. But I suppose from my perspective, it was a little bit different. My experience was almost, you know, like a home from home. Like you couldn't throw a stone in Sligo without hitting a cousin or a family member. So at one point, I think I had eight cousins and two brothers in the school. So from that perspective, you, you, you were immediately, you had someone to welcome you. You had a couple of them that there were a few years ahead of you. Talking about facial hair, I think you know some of them had mustaches at fourteen. So we were well protected. You know, you were well looked after. And if, if anything, you know, you're going into a school with a thousand boys, it's pretty daunting. 
Uh, but I even remember the first week and friends that I made that week are friends that I have today. And it certainly gave me a huge appreciation of community and, and family and, uh, and building that, that network. Uh, but yeah, from my perspective, it was actually a very easy transition. I think from, from that, because of my personal experience where I had family there already, they were able to tell me which, uh, which teachers were the ones which treat which way and uh, what to look out for, what the watchouts were. And uh, yeah, so it was a very comfortable uh, transition and a uh, very enjoyable one. <coughs> Excuse me. And Cormac, you're coming in now uh, and you had, you were the last of the line or near the last of the line where you had the brothers. Uh, had you any resistance? In, were, was there any side of you saying, I prefer to go to Kula or from what I've heard of this Summerhill place, maybe it might be for me. Or were you bursting to get in? You came in as a boarder, right? I did, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I was bursting to get in, but certainly, um, you know, six of my older brothers had already gone through Summerhill. There was probably, there was three of them there. So that really helped. I mean, I went in as a boarder, 12 years of age, so it was it was pretty daunting. So you learn uh, to grow up fairly quickly and become independent. Um, my father also went to Summerhill. So again, we have a long tradition there. So it, it was just a natural thing to do. Um, but again, having those older brothers there certainly did help. Um, but, you know, it, it over the years in Summerhill, I guess, you know, back to what Phelan said earlier, I, you know, one thing that struck me about it is the high standards, the high standards in Summerhill right across um, everything, particularly, you know, in terms of sport and academic achievement as well. So, you know, as a young 12 year old coming into Summerhill, that was something that you were looking to do. You're looking to play football, uh, Gaelic, soccer, your sport was a big attraction at the time, particularly for me uh, heading into Summerhill. This is really interesting territory for me and that we've got people in all sorts of different areas, you know, some financial services, some entrepreneurs, some in the legal game. Frank, who's a scientist, uh, um, were your future careers shaped in Summerhill or did that come later? At what stage, say, for instance, during that period of adolescence, did you find that Maybe this is the direction I might move in. And, and did the school itself have to inf help to influence you in that direction? Philem, can I, can I throw that one to you first because of the direction you took? That's, yeah, I find that a difficult one as well, Tommy. I think if you go back to when we were in school in the late 60s, early 70s, um, you were fairly well cut off from the outside world to a degree. And what happened in, in the world of work or in, even in universities, I would have been the first in my family to go to university. We didn't know that world. And um, to that extent, I'm not sure that, that that secondary school would determine, I suppose, where you went in your future life. What uh, course did you take you afterwards? How, how did your path progress after school? I studied engineering in UCD and um, worked for a number of years as, a, as, a, as, a, as an engineer and then mechanical engineering. <laughs> and, um, Subsequently, did studied accounting in in Sligo, and drifted into into small business consultancy, and then eventually uh, set up a business here in in uh, in Finisclare. And Frank, was so, you? Was there any, you know, encouragement of that scientific gene in you, or where did that come from? Well, that's that that's fascinating because um, <clears throat> it's a story that I shouldn't tell students. Um, uh, I'm in science because uh, I think I didn't get any encouragement. In fact, uh, in the leaving cert, um, the, the, the teacher, Tom Fanning, came into the class and said, uh, boys, they've changed the curriculum. I can't keep up with it. You're going to have to learn it yourself. And uh, that was fantastic because I remember uh, Brian Milton, Bernie Milton, Frank McLaughlin from Riverstown, uh, Michael Miley, myself, Noel Carl, uh, we used to meet and we used to try to work out all of this science stuff. And there's no better training for, for life and for, for university and everything uh, than to try to work that out yourself. And I discovered very quickly, there's some things I liked in that and some things I hated, some things I was good at, something I was bad at. And uh, perversely, that made me do a science. Science was my worst subject in my leaving cert. 
And that's not boasting. It's just that that was how bad we were at teaching ourselves. But but I got an honour in it, but scraped an honour in those those days was fine. Uh, and it made me feel that I should go on and 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 work things out for myself, which was a big lesson. And science happened to be the mode for doing it. Gary had career guidance uh, become more refined by the time you were working <laughs> your way through the school. Or how was it with you? Do you, do you, do you trace in the same way as I can trace back to Cyril Hearn teaching me English, Mary Cairns teaching me English, you know, being in school plays, being in debates. I can see some of the genes that sort of brought me in a direction afterwards coming from the Summer Hill days. Was it the same with you or were you a self-starter? Uh, to, to a degree, I mean, you know, they are your formative years. They're your, you know, your, your teen years. Um, I certainly do look back and see where I did have a leaning towards business. And I remember Mrs. McManus got me an A in my accounting and uh, we had uh, a Peter Ford actually who was also, you know, and this is back to the culture of excellence and the, and the inspirational leaders around us. You know, we had Peter Ford and TJ, teachers in the school, but also coaches of the, the Gaelic team. And these people were playing in front of 80,000 people in Crow Park. So you always had that inspiration around you and those, those people who were really blazing a trail in, in what they were doing. So I do think I always did have a, a sense that I was leaning towards business, but it really crystallized when I went to college and I did loan accounting in college, but then I actually worked in an investment bank, worked in an accounting firm and worked in a law firm. So then I, I thought that uh, as a corporate lawyer, you ultimately would pull all that together. You pull all those skills together. So it, uh, you know, as a lawyer to be able to understand the economics and understand and read a, a set of financial statements has been a, a good plus. Um, but yeah, I would say definitely, yeah, the foundations were certainly formed between the great teachers. I, I certainly had, uh, and then were honed and, and crystallized as I, as I went down through my career and then, then got some real life work experience and then made the decision to, to go full time into, into corporate law. And was it the same with you, Cormac? Were there people there who were shaping and saying, you might be good at a certain thing? Or were those instincts nurtured at secondary school level? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there was anybody kind of saying, you know, specifically to me, because I guess at the time career guidance wasn't, wasn't great, but um, certainly I was very much influenced by teachers. Um, I originally... Um, wanted to do environmental science um, in Sligo IT. And, you know, Tommy McManus and John McGettrick would have been very influen influential in terms of, you know, my developing my interest in environmental science. But second to that, I also had Joan Delaney, who was a fantastic accounting teacher. And, um, you know, she nurtured that interest in accounting. And my second choice was accounting. And um, three days before the environmental science degree was due to start, it was canceled due to lack of funds. So I ended up with my second choice, but again, both choices were influenced by, by, by my teachers. And, you know, ironically, I headed off on a path in terms of accounting and business that uh, was completely different than my, my first choice um, 35 years ago. You're all men of the world. Um, I was at a wedding there last year. Uh, my friend Austin Jennings, his daughter was getting married and I'd never been at one of these weddings before. It was a Black Rock and Mount Anvil wedding in Dublin. So it was the Rock and the Mounties. And this was a very sort of Dublin phenomenon, right? And I'd never seen it. But of course, Jennings knew there were a few fellas there from Summer Hill and he flew the flag very proudly for Summer Hill. Do you find it in your world that the Summer Hill thing has got a certain cachet, that there's a name recognition there? And if so, what does it stand for? Uh, McSherry, you're probably the most social animal of everybody. So you tell us what this being from Summer Hill stand for out in your world. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you look at the Dublin schools and they're a much smaller population. Like if you can get through a school with a thousand boys and you know, those a thousand every year going out into the world, I mean, the, the reputation precedes itself. And yeah, certainly from, from my perspective, you know, in my work, I deal with, I do transactions right across the world, be it China, be it India, be it France, and you, you can hold your own. And I think I also got a, a huge appreciation as for, for travel and culture. When I was in Summerhill, we got to go on two amazing school tours. We got to go to France and Italy on one, and we got to go to Sweden and Denmark. So you got a huge insight and appreciation and the initial in terms of travel and culture and understanding cultures and understanding that ultimately when you when you understand the culture, you can negotiate. You know, if you're dealing with in France, you tend to need to go for a long lunch before you agree anything. 
in China, you're just peeling layers of an onion in terms of are we actually talking to the decision maker? Uh, in India, they're promising in the world, and then you really have to get down to well, what are you delivering? So that, you know, there's a huge there was a huge appreciation from that that I, I certainly got from. Uh, from so he'll stand for anything in the circles you're you're mixing in. You ever come across people say, "Oh, Jesus, yeah, I heard of that place." Do they say it's poor still, or do they say that it's you know really high end stuff? Or what a reputation does it have? Any reputation in your travels? It does, and I mean, one of my partners at my firm also went to Summerhill with a couple of other people who, who were there. So no, it certainly does, and it, and it holds great cachet. It always had a, a culture of excellence. I think others have said on 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 the on the call. So it's uh, no, it certainly does. And for you, Phil, and that diocesan college thing that drew students from not just Sligo in the boarding days, but you know, you could have them from Donegal. We had some from Jamaica. We had some from the states. Uh, of course, you had them, the Rossies, uh, because of the Elfin connection. Do you did you find in the course of your work in life that Summerhill meant something other than just a school? I think it did, Tommy, and and to some extent, the name itself possibly made it that little bit different because most secondary schools would have been called after saints, and and you had Summerhill College in Sligo, and people couldn't readily identify was it a was it a, a grammar school or. As <laughs> co-educational school or whatever, but it had that cachet, I suppose, of being slightly different and, and maybe um, slightly um, not alternative, but, but um, probably just different to others and, and with a sense of achievement, a sense of excellence along with that as well. And there was the school in England, I think, um, Summer Hill, uh, which was a very, very adventurous school and, and completely different to our subjects were taught completely differently to the way they'd normally be taught. And I think at times in the UK, people may get mixed up between the UK Summerhill and the Ireland Summerhill. But I think it probably always worked to our advantage in a way, um, in that it enhanced that sense of otherness, I think, that, that probably Summerhill did have. And Frank, you went on to become a distinguished academic at one stage in your career, as well as doing your your, your work in uh, in Nottingham, studying in Nottingham. You were done to teach. You were Lester, Lester. Tommy Sorry, Lester. Lester. Excuse me, Frank. Uh, Lester. Uh, I mixed up the <laughs> soccer teams. It's Leicester City. Uh, I'd never do that, Tommy. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you, you actually taught in what, what's now called NUIG, uh, but University College Galway to people of our generation where Jimmy Brown, one of our past pupils, was a distinguished president. But you actually set up a course there, made a big imprint, uh, you go on to work in Australia, you run a very, very important research centre there. Uh, in, now into your late 80s or 70s, sorry, early 70s, you're still working. Um, how significant was that summer hilting in your CV? Was it a sort of a blip or was it sort of adding to the layers? Well, actually, the two parts. Obviously, most of the time I had to spend... Uh, when I was working in Germany and France as well, explaining where Ireland was. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get as far as Luxembourg, so I couldn't teach the coach of their team where Ireland was, but that was a different matter. Um, in addition to that, uh, I, I think that, so that didn't make any difference, but I did have to decide and did decide very early in my CV to call it Summerhill College and not the College of the Immaculate Conception because uh, explaining the Immaculate Conception in addition to Ireland would have been far too big a challenge. So I, and I, I think it's much better branding to call it Summerhill College and just use that. Colm, uh, or Cormac, excuse me, um, in, in your life, um, how important is that Summerhill thing? How useful was it? Would you meet people in business and say, oh yeah, he was in Summerhill? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I think, Certainly in the early days, you know, when I would have uh, spent my early career in Dublin, you know, I think that the brand name Summerhill was was very big. And, you know, you were always proud to say where you were from, what school you went to. You always found that people knew of the school, they knew of the reputation of the school. So I thought that was, you know, um, very interesting, particularly, you know, as I was getting myself established in Dublin for those first couple of years. Um, in later life, then, you know, you, you come across people all the time through business, through work, who have gone through Summerhill. And the one thing that strikes you is that, you know, that there seems to be a special bond between those people. It's like as if you, you know, it's like one of your long lost friends, you know, when you pick up a conversation with them, it's like as if you never, um, you, you never left. Um, you know, I find that there's a common culture that you share 
with with people who have gone to Summerhill. And, and generally, when you're dealing with th those people, whether it be in the workplace, through business, um, which we always come across those people who have gone through Summerhill, I just find that the culture uh, of those people is very, very simple, similar to your own. And to have that kind of shared background is, is, has been very, very useful. The, the, the language is fascinating. The, the things we learn, you know, the nicknames, um, you know, the traditions, they always stay with you in the same way as the four lights means something to most people from Sligo because anyone who's been around for the years of the four lanterns in Phelan's day, Orbeez was the place fellas used to slip down there. Sometimes if they were really bold, Hollands. Uh, and, you know, we, we had those sort of episodes in our lives. Um, have you found that some of the friends you still have today uh, and we've got guys going across the different decades here. Is your circle of friends today, you know, does it include a Summerhill contingent? Frank, you're the eldest. Yeah, I know. I'm still, thanks for the reminder, Tommy. Um, no, I, actually, I, I'm, I'm really a, a proud member of a group called uh, Vintage Reds, and they're all Summer Hills, and uh, they keep me in regular contact with Sligo Rovers and, and, and some of them are online. So that's very important for me. There are others, uh, like Damien Courtney is still online. There, there are people that I have maintained contact with at all times, and I think that has been important because particularly when you move around the world and live in different places, uh, you do need to have a mooring that is where you feel this is where I've come from. And I may not get back to the mooring too often, but at least, you know, this is where you came from. And I think that if you can mix metaphors, that grounds you by having that mooring that, that allows you to, to feel that it's you're part of that community. And Tommy, I'd have to say yourself as well, like sure, um, th that I'm sure came not just from Sligo, but from Summerhill, shared cultural backgrounds and uh, my best friend. Thank you, sir. Uh, Phelan, yourself, have you kept up your circle of friends? Is there still a, a handful from Summerhill or more than a handful? Yeah, yeah. Regrettably, I suppose, Tommy, over the years, you, I found that uh, I haven't kept in touch with as many people as I'd like to have kept in touch with. There are a number of people that we meet, um, not that regularly either, but we do keep up contact and uh, revisit old times as often, I suppose, as, as circumstances allow. Um, and I, I, I just one of the regrets I'd have, I suppose, about my working life is that I probably became so consumed and involved in it that I let that other side of my life to some extent um, uh, diminish uh, when when I probably um, it would have been would have been better for me if I had kept more in touch with that circle of friends that I had from Summerhill. Gary, have you got a, a Summerhill Mafia? Is there a sort of a click of you that stick together as if it, it's yesterday? <laughs> well, it, I, I suppose it's the, there's the McSharry and the Cousin Mafia as well. So again, I was lucky where some of my cousins are obviously some of my best friends and a number of them were like Gabe's was in my class, Brian Burke was in my class, you had Mel, you had Tom, Patrick, Stephen, you had Trevor, my brother, Connor, my brother, Tom. So, you know, there was... Uh, it was always great camaraderie and we're obviously always still in, in touch and get to go to all the family occasions together. And then other friends like Kevin O'Donnell, I would have met the first day I went there. I, I was talking to him today and uh, how we're still friends is because we saw so much of each other because we were in class together all year and then we beach carded Ross's Point Beach together. So we were together nearly 365 days of the year. So that was always uh, that was always good fun. So I'm no, glad to say uh, still in touch with a, with a number of them. Corbett, nobody would be better equipped to talk about this than you because you've got the intelligence of the brothers as well. So you know if that Cairns network has got an extended Summerhill family. You, if, if you just have four or five friends each, cripes, you know, it's quite a community in itself. Quite a yeah, it's, you know, and any family gathering is always liable to break out into a discussion around Summerhill and all the various stories, which of course we can't repeat on this call. Um, so, can, you know, any. We can, Cormac. <laughs> but um, it's certainly a, a significant bore fest for, for our wives who, you know, oh, oh no, here we go again with the Summerhill stories. But, um, you know, generally, I guess, you know, because I was a boarder, a lot of the um, 
people who boarded with me and friends at the time were from all over the country and and a bit like Phil and I, you know, haven't kept in touch with with most of these guys uh, because they scattered to the wind once you did your leave insert. But you know, your, your circle of friends now tend to be uh, Sligo rather than Summerhill, and yes, a portion of them are from Summerhill. But um, uh, yeah, from a from a family perspective, certainly, yeah, we have we have lots of good memories and good stories that we continually share at every possible opportunity. You know, the, the author Flannery O'Connor said once that there's a book in anyone who survives adolescence because it can be a tough time. <laughs> now, Summerhill, you go in there at 13, you're going to do five years, 12, 13, and you're going to come out at 18. So like, it's a huge space in your life. Um, how, how do you see yourselves as whether you were shaped by it. And if that's the case, um, you're thinking of the young lads who are going through it today. Um, what advice would you give young guys about that period? Did you have good and bad times in it? Were there unhappy times in it? Or was it in general, was it a good time in your lives that you were able to enjoy during the moment? Or were there times when you felt really, this is, I'm not happy here. So what would be your reflections for young guys looking back today, young guys of today, as you look back on your times there, can I start with you on that, Gary? Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I had a great time in Summerhill. As I say, it was like a home from home, had a huge amount of family. It was like where all your buddies were and family were in the one place. Now you have to make big arrangements and plans to catch up with everybody. School, they were all there. And you got to catch up and and uh, have a lot of fun and, and work hard. You know what I definitely learned: what you what you put into something, you get out. And I certainly learned that in Summerhill when you worked hard, you did well. Whether it be it sport, be it uh, be it academic. So you know fr from that perspective, I'd I'd really you know, in terms of the, the student population now, what really stood to me: you really stay true to yourself. I'm actually I'm a mentor for some of the TY students right now, and I was delighted to receive details of the the two career reports. One wants to be a jockey and one wants to be a chef. And I was immediately thinking to myself, that is brilliant. These are people following their passions. They're not being conditioned. They're not being society telling them you need a permanent pension bill or you need to be this, you need to be that. You know, ultimately stay true to your passions, back yourself, uh, have courage of your own convictions. And, uh, and ultimately when you put in the work, you, you tend to always get it out and keep a balance. That's the, the real, you know, there is a lot of talk about work-life balance, but it is all life. And uh, being able to maintain uh, your sense of self and maintain a, a sense of, of purpose within that is uh, is is critical. Um, so yeah, that would be a uh, sixpence worth. And Cormac, how would you say look back on on that time, you know, five year period, and how would you, if you're advising, you know, young lads today, what would you tell them based on your own experience? I guess. Uh... You know, when you look back after 35 years, you know, you really only remember the good times, you know, there were lots of bad times, uh, you know, there was lots of downs, ups and downs uh, during those five years. And again, particularly as a boarder, it was it was a tough, it was a tough time being away from home, etc. Um, but I think, you know, um, you develop a certain level of resilience during that period. Um, you know, I think from a work ethic point of view, it was something that I look back and say, well, you know, that came from Summerhill. I think uh, we did three hours study, supervised study every day for five years from from day one. Uh, as a boarder, you had to do it. Um, that, you know, got into good habits, you know, setting high standards for yourself, uh, good work, work ethic and all of that. And, you know, I think that you've got to take those knocks. I mean, you, you've got to have those bad times to enjoy the good times. And I think that, um, you know, when you're, when you're trying to get through your, those five years, it, it can be challenging. It can be tough because there's so much um, pressure on the leave insert and the CEO and the points race, which is a bit ridiculous, you know, when you, because ultimately you can be whoever you want to be. Uh, as Gary said, they, you know, the be true to yourself, you know, follow your dream. If it, you know, don't pigeonhole yourself into a, <clears throat> a particular career that um, ultimately you may not enjoy, you may not like. I mean, I went down the route of, of accounting by accident, as I said. I wanted to do environmental science. 
Um, and over the last 35 years, I've actually done seven completely different, uh, worked in seven completely different disciplines across multiple different industries. So, um, you know, like it, it's, it's um, ultimately it's about it trying to enjoy what you do, um, you know, trying to find that true north, you know, that, that, that makes you happy uh, rather than going down a route ultimately that, you know, a job that you might be looking to get a good salary, a good wage, a permanent pension job. I think those days are gone. I think people are much more flexible now, much more uh, likely to, to to follow their dreams and hopefully make a career out of those dreams. And Phelan, like based on your experience, you were there border when it was a yeah the mix of borders and day students. You had an enlightened principal coming and you no know, corporal punishment was going out the door. Thanks be to God, that's gone now. It's a different kind of a world, but for young lads who are going through that period uh, of, you know, national school to secondary school, and then suddenly you're at the mercy of the next phase of your life, what would you say to them about how to try and, and get through and make the most uh, and develop uh, in the most holistic way during that five year summer hill space? Yeah, no, I think it, it's difficult for for anybody moving from primary school into secondary school. It's especially if, you, if you're moving into a school where where it's mostly new people you're meeting. I think that that can be a challenge. Um, and I would have seen that myself. I, my son Oshin went to Summerhill, and I would have seen it with him as well. That transition can be difficult. But I think there's a few things that um, I think that it takes a while, I suppose, just to find to find your place within within the school. And that it's natural that it doesn't happen on the first day. It possibly takes weeks or even months into the into the first year, even to the, into the second year before you you find yourself exactly. almost. So people I think should be should be or students should be conscious of that. But I suppose there's a couple of things. One would be sport. If you have an interest in sport, um, I think it's a great way of meeting friends and and it's great for your physical development, obviously, as well. But and and from a discipline point of view, particularly if you're playing competitive sport and you're training with the team or you're training for athletics or whatever it might be, um, that can add a significant dimension to your life in secondary school. Um, and I, I think, I suppose, we have to kind of you develop also. And I think Cormac may have mentioned this: a certain resilience. Um, if you're mixing with, in our case, I think it was six to seven hundred students, of which borders maybe two to three hundred, and as a border, you're there twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, because we didn't get that many um, times going home, and you you have to, to have a certain level of resi resilience coming out of that. Um, and again, it takes a while to build that, and but it does stand to you later on in your in your in your in your working life. Um, as a boarder at the time I was there, uh, there was a hardcore of people that were uh, avid lead supporters and Leeds were doing very, very well at the time under Don Revy and were winning trophies left, right and centre. And for those of us that followed uh, teams that play, played a superior form of football like Manchester United, uh, they made life very, very difficult for us. But um, you just learn to live with that. There's no way back from it. Um, you just had to accept it and uh, I suppose the only thing is that there'll always come a time when tables will turn and I did find an opportunity at one stage when Alex Ferguson was was um, having the success he had with his team and I met one of those lads and my inner child emerged and I, <laughs> I took some I took some um, enjoyment out of, of, of balance of, of scale just, yeah exactly exactly yeah Frank, but again the same sorry. issue with, with you um, in yeah. terms of what you'd say to young guys, to today's, you know, our successors, the guys we got to look out for, what would you say to them about their journey and their families, yeah. their parents, their journey through? Yeah, success? so I, I, I uh, when thinking about this morning, uh, sorry, this evening, your time, uh, one thing recurred to me a few times, and that was uh, said by Father Lava. Uh, who was our Irish teacher. And uh, remember, I was there in the 60 to 66, a delicate time in Ireland, Irish politics. And he said, uh, probably more than once because it resonated, he said, uh, others died for Ireland. You have to live for Ireland. 
And I thought that was a powerful message. And I, I, I think there's two aspects in it. First of all, uh, that Ireland is an important part of your life, but also you have to live for others. You have to have a commitment to your community and those around you. And therefore, never forget that you are part of a larger community. So even as I moved around the world, that, that sense of um, it is important to look where you are and to do your best for that is a really important aspect of, of, of my life. And, and that's why I, I'm a Queensland Reds rugby supporter. I'm a Leicester City supporter. I'm a, all of those things because I do feel that you have to get into your community and give back. And that's perhaps a slightly different message than the dominant one today, which is more inward looking. What's in it for me? Uh, what am I entitled to? It's the other way around. It's that you're not entitled to anything until you've earned it and you earn it by what you put into society. And that was a good general message, which was encapsulated in that short phrase. Well, when I was in Summerhill um, in first year, I got into my one and only fight. Uh, it was with the boarder from Balmulla called Tommy Kelly. Uh, and we were down at the end of the long corridor in the prefabs. Uh, and uh, he was on top of me and he says, I can keep you down here and I can beat you. Or I can let you up and we can shake hands. Uh, and that was in 1969, 1970. And he's godfather to my daughter today. He's living in Munich, and I'd say he's probably watching this. He's my friend for life. Yes. And I close my eyes sometimes, and I think of Summerhill. The only nightmare I have is I still wake up in a sweat thinking, leaving cert mats are on this morning, <laughs> and I have the hope. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, 74, do the sums, Tommy. That's 47 years later. So when you close your eyes, or when you... You hear the word Summerhill. What's the first thing that comes into your head? Cormac. Summerhill. Yeah, <clears throat> I guess the first thing that comes into my head is, is achievement in sport. You know, I, I, I think it's been mentioned already. I think uh, one of the reasons I would have loved been attracted to Summerhill in the first instance was, was sport. And, you know, Summerhill continues to excel in sport, you know, all sports. Uh, um, I know earlier on, uh, Frank, you were saying you were a squash guy, uh, but ultimately... wasn't squash. It was it was back alley soccer. <laughs> back alley soccer. Squ squash, squash hadn't been invented in then. Wasn't even orange <laughs> squash in the sixties. <laughs> but but Kia Ora. <laughs> I um, you know, I think I always remember going to the gym um, at the old Father Flanagan Hall and we were amazed at the photographs up on the wall of all the various teams that won All-Ireland titles down through the years. Um, you know, remembering David Pugh and all the PE classes, uh, just, you know, on the back rugby pitch, slogging it out in the muck and the dirt and the front pitch, watching, you know, Paul McGee come back and play, um, you know, former students. So to me, Summerhill was all about sport. Um, and I think, you know, it continues to this day. And, and I know a lot of the strategic developments that the, the college are looking at is, is centered around sport and sporting facilities. So th that would be my abiding memory and, and uh, of Summerhill is that excellence in sport and, you know, constantly competing at, at a very, very high level, you know, particularly in soccer throughout those years, you know, we were constantly in All-Ireland finals. Uh, didn't win too many of them in my day, but uh, certainly it was. It, the expectation was that you you got got to an All Ireland final at a minimum. You certainly were looking to win the Connacht titles every year. Well, and paint the picture for me, Summerhill. Well, is it the smell of the food? Uh, is it the dampness in the dressing rooms, or what is it? Yeah, a bit of, bit of the dampness in the dressing rooms, all right. But um, no, like Cormac, I have two very clear memories. One of going as a supporter down to to Toome Stadium, down to a Connacht final where we were playing St. Charlotte's. I think it must have been 70 or 71. And a huge crowd of Summerhill supporters went down and Summerhill had a fabulous team at the time and beat Charlotte's in Toome. And the sense of occasion, the sense of victory was, was absolutely immense. And it it's lives with me to this day. And another one was going, I think, to Tauta Park, probably in, in around the same time to win the All-Ireland um, soccer school boys um, that year. So that was the kind of level that things were at, probably much the same as, as it was in Cormac's time as well. But um, the other memory I do have of is as a boarder, 
um, when we were in Leaving Cert, we had most of the dormitories for prior years were big, big, big rooms, no separation between the beds, and you could have maybe 40 or 50 people in a dormitory. But in Leaving Cert, we were given smaller rooms, and there was seven or eight um, in, in, in each room. And we had, in, in my Leaving Cert year, I had a, a room with, with seven guys, seven other guys, and uh, just the camaraderie we had in that particular room and the range of interests of the guys that were in it was enormous. And um, I always think very, very fondly back on that and on the guys that were there at the time. It was that that's probably encapsulates those three memories would encapsulate Summer Hill for me. Frank, close your eyes. What comes up? Yeah, I did. And there, there are two things, that, not so much sport. I, I remember the influence of externals when uh, Seamus Creighton came back from Rome and Ricky Devine came from America, uh, Father Michael Devine. And um, he brought in just a completely different sense of culture. I remember I was in a, in a group, the Glee Club, uh, where we sing uh, Peter, Paul and Mary songs competitively. Um, we'd be in competitions for everything. He brought in basketball. He, he, he snuck soccer into the into the into the places where there shouldn't be played, etc. So, for my recollection, was just all of the diversity that came through those influences into what was, in fact, in Sligo in the sixties, a relatively tight community where everybody did everything more or less in the same way. And these came in with with different perspectives, and that that again was uh, was formative for me. Uh Gary, tell us tell us some of the sins and some of the memories. Yeah, I mean, like it's a collection, obviously, of, of of what has been said. But for me, I had a lot of fun in Summerhill. Yeah, I think yeah, not a huge like in the classes we were there to learn, and you tried to have fun, and you knew the teachers you could have a bit of crack with, and you the ones you, you couldn't. But in between, there was a lot of fun, and uh, you know, you had uh, fun on the field. You know, and we always perform to try and win. You're always trying to perform to the highest standard. You were playing against other schools who trained hard. You knew if you trained hard, you'd, you'd play well, you'd perform on the day. And, and same with, uh, same with the, the learning, same with the academics. But I think they, some of the key things, like the school tours were phenomenal. I, 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 and if anyone gets an opportunity, any of the schools are there now, or if they, you know, they were just brilliant in terms of opening your horizons, getting to know, like we pulled up outside a hotel in Sweden, uh, 60 lads and a bus full of 60 Finnish female students from a female school pulled up behind us. And we were just like, God, we're in heaven. This is, <laughs> yeah, and then the banter and the crack you had. So uh, that, that's certainly my abiding memory is, uh, is the fun we had uh, and, uh, and what we learned. And, and, the, and they were very much our, our formative years and gave us a platform to, to move on to, to other things. I got a... Um... I got a text uh, the other night from Paul Brennan. He was in my class, Paul from Clannad. He was a boarder. And they were just after playing in the London Palladium at the UK end of the Clannad tour. And it just sort of brought home to me, uh, you know, the pride I have in that link. You see it with the Westlife lads. Phelan was talking there about Ski McGee and the guys. Uh, it was a beautiful program on Ocean FM at the weekend where there was a reunion of that football team. I was at that match, Phelan, you talked about, where Ski McGee was magic. Finney McTiernan and Andy Feather, Fergo Hopper, all the guys, Leo Boland, uh, just wonderful guys. They also paid tribute to two of their year who are no longer with us, Howard Chicken Higgins and uh, Rafey Rooney. You know, great guys. But those memories of players like that, like they're fantastic. And, you know, you see young Kenny now, uh, you know, who's a Sligo guy, uh, and okay, they've got the Kula link as well as the Sligo link, but you just become so conscious of these guys who are doing wonderful things. And one of the lessons of life for me is, fellas are able from all walks of life in Summerhill to actually go out there uh, and to make their name, make their way. I see Donald Gaynor sending in a little email there. There he is over there, big whaler dealer in, you know, high finance in the States. You look at Christy Jones' nephew, and you think of the values Christy Jones gave us in Summerhill. I saw him when we were there. He used to take fellas down to the Vincent de Paul, and he was out painting houses for travellers out at Gibraltar. I saw him bringing us down to St. Columbus and singing at mass for the patients, uh, and just his social involvement and the examples he gave us. Um, were there individual teachers 
in particular who uh you know spark something in you uh was there a, a friend you had or was there a teacher you had who sort of became an inspiration for you who opened windows for you or who changed your way of thinking gary yeah, I mean, like, like, there's always such a, any number of characters and uh, they were always the catalyst for, you know, never miss an opportunity to have a bit of fun. Yeah, we'll take it serious when we need to. Um, but hey, like some of the, the teachers really stand out. I'd have to say Austin O'Callaghan just had such a great passion for a subject and it was just infectious. Um, so yeah, th any of the teachers you knew that had a passion for their subject, it was just you wanted to you wanted to see what they saw in it. How where was this passion coming from? So that inspired you to to, to pay more attention, frankly, and uh, and to focus on it. But you also had a, had a lot of empathy. You know, he would be tuning into the individual. You know, in terms of what's going on or what's happening behind. You know, and 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 that's. Uh, that's a great trait in a in a teacher because they, they have a huge responsibility now. You know, there's a lot of things going on in people's lives, and ultimately to be able to tune in to where the student is at and and to try and give some individual because they are all unique. And uh, ultimately, back to the point in terms of staying true to yourself, you know, you can have a sense where there's just so many there. How do you do that? How do you be an ambassador and how do you be a, an inspiration for someone to stay true to themselves if you're just putting them all collectively and then shoving the information in and vomit it out over one exam over a couple of hours. Uh, but that is something that that's how teachers that have that vocation and have that passion and who really understand that education is holistic. It's not just the subject, it's understanding where the student is and, uh, and, and trying to meet them where they're at and bringing them on, bringing them on. Um, so yeah, but yeah, certainly Austin, Austin does, but yeah, a number of others as well. Frank, you're, you're listening to this and we know that there's a young principal in Summerhill, but tell us your views about say, the role teachers can have. We were walking the other day out in Strand Hill and we came across Josephine Finan. She was one of the first female teachers in Summerhill. Jesus, her eyes were out in stalks when she arrived because she was like, <coughs> no. So Josephine told us the other day, she was 21 when she came to Summerhill and she was just, you know, barely older than we were. Uh, and she was she was in a different level uh, and she influenced us in so many ways, too. So how what what do you want to say to the teachers and the principal and who will be watching this? Yeah, I, I think um, they never know the influence they're going to have because they're being themselves and the students are on the recipient end. And I, I've given a few examples of different people who, who did things in Summerhill, the teachers that had an influence. I didn't mention one uh, who had perhaps a more perversive long-term influence. And that was uh, Father Tiernan, who was the uh, English teacher. He loved English. He loved poetry. He loved writing properly. He tried as hard as he could to beat out, and I don't mean beat in that sense, to remove from my, my way of writing what he was called the purple passages. I couldn't use one adjective, I'd have to use four of them. And he'd say, tidy it up, bring it back to the Reader's Digest. Now, I think that worked with you, Tommy, but it didn't work with me. I'm still kind of fairly florid in my language, but I remember him as being a very positive uh, intellectual input into what was happening, analysing the plays which are on the courses, but going beyond that. Um, but I really think for the for the teachers, um, the, the responsibility is massive because um, words will stick in people's minds, form it, ideas will be formed. And there's another aspect to this as well, Tommy, because you did mention students as well. One of the things I learned from my classmates was to be humble because I thought I was pretty sharp, but there were people like Frank McLaughlin and Bernie Milton, uh, Michael Miley, who would beat me any day of the week in any examination. And that kept me in my box, which was needed. So looking at your colleagues and being inspired by them, but also being constrained by them, drove me to do even, try to be as good as they were. Really interesting comments, Frank. Phelan, um, on that question of lessons learned and influences from, from fellow students, but also from teachers, is, is that true in your case as well? It was Tommy. Yes, um, in, in it was two two teachers in particular that that I have the fondest of regards for, um, and had a significant influence on my life. Not from a career point of view, because I went in a technical direction, um, in in studies and and work afterwards. But um, one was Father Latham, 
um, Pader Latin on Irish, who Frank has already mentioned, and the other was Brendan O'Connor, who was my English teacher for at least three years, I think. And both of them gave me, um, I suppose, a love of reading and a love of literature that has stayed with me ever since. And whenever I am reading something or, or thinking about something in, in English literature or in Irish history, even because Father Lavin had an interest in history as well, I always remember them. And it wasn't that the Father Levin could be robust in, in, in the way he, he taught and he could be quite demanding, <laughs> to, put it, to put it mildly, I suppose. But at the same time, he, he had a very broad vision of Irish literature, of the short story form, um, of poetry in Irish as well. And, and he just Im, imbued a sense of, of love in me, certainly in that regard, and, and of writing as well. And Brendan Connor had a completely different um, approach. Brendan was known as Batman, um, and he was very, very laid back, but very, um, he, he just sucked you in, I suppose, into the subject. And it's always then been an asset to me that I've had, um, I can put the technical stuff to one side and then I can pick up a book or um, any piece of, of literature and, and kind of get lost in that and recognize how it was constructed and recognize the artistry that has gone into the, the writing of that particular piece, whatever it might be. Father Lavin had a saying that always stood with me, and I'm not sure if I have the grammar right, but it was Uignus Iliot on Ordelian Torah, which is the universal loneliness of the supreme artist, I suppose. And in when he was saying that to us, he was kind of trying to get us to see, I suppose, the loneliness of the artist and, and the process by which he created. And that, that was a significant um, influence on my life. It's amazing the way the phrases come back. I remember Tommy Finnegan saying one time, a cliche is a truth, is a truth that's repeated over and over again. Uh, and I found that an interesting observation as well. Um, also remember, you know, you, you talk about different influences. I remember one day Kevin Early, Lord Restham, uh, made a shot at teaching us about the birds and the bees, a sort of a sex education class. Jesus, we were, barely, we were barely able to walk after it, you know? It was great fun. I remember, I think we were in second year at the time. Uh, was, you know, he did his level best, but I suppose we were a bit ahead of the curve anyway. Um, Cormac, on that score, um, on influences and things that stay with you, uh, are there occasions, are there individuals, are there teachers who you know, you know, are, are they on your shoulder or they're in your ear at different times in your life? Well, you know, funny you mentioned Kevin Early. I think uh, you, teaching you about the birds and the bees. I mean, I have lots of memories of Kevin teaching us everything but what he was meant to be teaching us. So he used to give us lots of stories about, about everything. I think the hunger strikes were going on at the time. Um, I always remember him saying to us, <clears throat> don't mind that nonsense. They have a box of Mars bars under the bed that they eat every night. <laughs> but um, I, I guess uh, Austin O'Callaghan for me would, would stand out. I mean, you know, he, he just made maths so much fun to learn. He was, he was an exceptional teacher, exceptional knowledge as a subject. And I always remember uh, a rumor went around once that he had, he was leaving Summerhill and he was going to, to, to teach in a university and, and we were absolutely traumatized that this, this couldn't be happening to us, but uh, thankfully he didn't leave and um, uh, definitely he would have been a major influence in terms of um, uh, just making, you know, not trading that uh, honours maths paper in the Leaving Cert. Um, but also, uh, apart from the academic side, I guess, um, you know, our uh, Peter Ford and TJ Kilgallen, um, I think they arrived I'm not quite sure 84, 85, but certainly in my last year, and they took over the coaching of the senior uh, football team at the time. They would only have been maybe 22, I guess, at the time, but they just to us at the time obviously seemed an awful lot older. But how they how they managed that team, how they coached that team, you know, they brought the whole ethos of Mayo uh, in terms of their professionalism into the college. Uh, we got to an, won a Connacht title that year in 85, got to the All Ireland final, and Certainly, I would have learned an awful lot from those two guys in terms of, you know, uh, managing football teams tactically. You know, they used to keep us in for hours in the classroom and they'd be up on the blackboard doing out the tactics and for, for the games. And um, that was an eye opener at the time. And that, that you know, 
1985, they were so far ahead of, of their time in terms of coaching. So they're the memories that stand out for me. Um, I was horrified. And I think the world, the world went round the world to a certain small audience when the place went on fire, when the old building went on fire. I think we were all <laughs> horrified when we saw that. But I also have to say that every time I drive that new road in Sligo, uh, I pass down by Summerhill and I see the new building there. Uh, I get I get a lump in my throat because they were, in many respects, they were the best years of my life. Um, I I wasn't a boarder in name, but I was in practice. I was. I did six years there, and I loved every. I loved the fun. The time we made a mess of our leaving cert in seventy four, and we had to go back. I was kind of delighted when Paddy Bull, Father Lavin gave the word, the card players were caught out. We had been playing a lot of poker that year because I knew we had a good soccer team again in 75. And I remember that empty feeling when the leaving cert was done and you were walking away from the place and you realised, cripes, it's over. I'm never going to see these guys again. Um, did you have a, a kind of loneliness when you were leaving it or were you, were you ready to move on? Frank. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I wasn't excited about moving on. I remember, do you remember they used to have the retreats and I, there lots of soul searching went on in those three days where we weren't allowed to make as much noise as otherwise. And I remember thinking in my leaving start, all of the others are dead keen to get out of here. I wasn't, I, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I felt it was, uh, it, it was a, a, an easy transition into life, but not one that I, I wanted to get away from. And just one other thing, I, I, I had a thought earlier on. One of the best things in terms of the teachers, I remember uh, Michael Kine, uh, Lugin, was the maths teacher. He was a formidable figure, but he took um, those who, who he thought were interested in learning maths at his lunchtime uh, to teach us extra. So, so it, it was a, a great commitment to the individual by somebody who could have gone off and had a cup of tea himself. But yeah, so I, I, I missed that. I missed all of those things. And I suppose I was a bit scared going out in the world. Like I only knew Sly going up and down uh, to Summer Hill and, and back again. That was, we, we didn't go on any tours at Gary. That didn't exist in, the, in our day. So uh, moving away all the way to Galway was, was an exciting challenge, nervous uh, move. Um, but it, it was it was uh, not something that I left saying, "Wow, great, I'm free." Quite the opposite. Was it was, was it for you a happy release, uh, Phelan? Or because you had been a boarder now, uh, and you were getting back to your family for a time, and you know, getting back to the normal life, or was there had you mixed feelings when the time came? Uh, there was indeed, Tommy. Yeah, that, um, I suppose I remember. I have a recollection of when I went to Summerhill first after being there a few months, just coming to this um, um, acknowledgement, I suppose, that Summerhill was my home. And I, I could get out of Summerhill occasionally for Christmas, Easter and summer, but it was my home. And it, it was just, I had, to, I had to do a little bit of a, a rethink about myself then. And um, so when it came to leaving cert, um, that was the big transition because you were going from that situation out into something completely new, as I said before, I was the first to go to university, so you didn't know what you were doing. So there's a huge level of apprehension. But I suppose it was mixed from that point of view, maybe looking forward, um, not knowing, but looking forward to it at least. And um, a sense that I had done my time also, that it was time to, to move on. But from a boarding point of view, it was unusual because we all did different subjects. So by the time I had finished my leaving cert, maybe two thirds of the boarders had gone home. So there was a kind of a sense of a lack of, of um, finality, a, lack of a communal thing yeah. goodbye, we'll say, a lack of yeah. finality. It was a little bit about that. So it was, a, it, it was it was just a little bit strange, but I suppose looking forward to the to the next step um, and and just, um, I suppose, trying to make that transition in, in your head, really. Uh, Gary, you were probably part of the generation that had grads and, you know, you all got ticking up and had a few <laughs> class and, you know, we weren't, it wasn't as, uh, it wasn't as developed in our time. So were you just ready to go off and embrace the next phase? You were sort of used to this notion of third level. You, you're, you're much younger than we are. 
Yeah, and I, I quite a you know, testament to the the formation that Summerhill gave me. I was ready. I was ready to move to the next level, and that was the whole idea of Summerhill was to to give you those that skill set, give you that confidence, give you that ambition to be able to move on to the next level. And I was certainly ready. Certainly missed the place. And then there was a continuous threat. Like one of my co Brian Burke was in UL with me. Brian Kern, we shared a house for a couple of years, another Summerhill. So, you know, you, you always had that uh, that group of, of Summerhill connections uh, from, from then on. So you, you always had that link and uh, that commonality. Uh, and in your case, uh, Cormac, um, when you were, say, moving out, um, Okay, it's over. But nowadays, because you're still, you're living, we're talking to you tonight in Suey, when you drive over that road or when you're coming in by the roundabout, if you're, you're over Circular Road or you're there at the roundabout, probably more often on the, main, on the, on, on the, the drive by road, um, do you still get a, a sense of the place? Is it, does time stand still or do you go back or what happens with you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, no more than yourself, Tommy. Every time you you drive down the uh, uh, the new road and you see the the fire damage, you know, you get a lump in your throat because basically that's the dormitory that we had when we were leaving certs and <clears throat> right under those where that roof is burned was was where we uh, where the sinks were. So um, yeah, I think you always glance in, you always look at. Um, the splendor, I guess, of the school today and any opportunity we get to go in and have a look around, it's it's, it's fascinating to see the developments. Um, and, you know, I was certainly, um, you know, not not in a hurry to get out of Summerhill because we had a fantastic uh, 84 or 85, um, particularly 85, you know, it was all about football. So we had an absolute ball in our final year. So we weren't in a rush to get out. Um, like Phelan, I did have that transition, you know, from basically Summerhill being my home to now living full time at home because I went to Sligo IT afterwards. But a lot of Summerhill guys went to Sligo IT. So it was a fairly easy transition uh, for me out of, out of Summerhill. But I certainly wouldn't have said that I was um, uh, dying to get out of it. Um, certainly it was it. it we'd like to have repeated 85 again in 86 if we could. And um but yeah, like it's it's even today, you always have an interest in Summerhill. You have an interest in how they're doing um, academically, sporting wise, etc., development wise, and um, you know it's great to see the new school there. It's, I think it's a it's it's great to see it in that prominent position. You know, when you enter the town, it's 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 the first thing you see. Um, I met two girls last week. Um, they were went to the Louis in Bondorn. And I remembered meeting them when I went down there debating with Eddie Henry 50 years ago, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was like yesterday, except we're old people. Look, this is great fun. We've overrun it. We've got run on for 75 minutes. And I can see there's a lot of material coming in. So I'm going to bring Paul Kyo back into the conversation. And Paul, maybe what you might do is just run some of the feedback we've been getting, some of the questions that our audience have, have fed into you. Uh, while we were having our fun and we can maybe throw that open to the lads here. Yeah, no problem at all. Some really good comments here. Uh, and thanks to, to Donner that is talking. Uh, he visited us recently, Tommy, um, and he's saying that uh, the wide variety of student leadership transition, transition year classes and staff, um, he came away impressed that there was uh, no lack of ambition. There was confidence, there was humour and there was global awareness um, and he says that it's all the more reason why we should continue to support the am ambitious development plan to give them every chance to compete at the highest level into the future. Um, two great words that capture this evening, the bond to do Summerhill and friendships and the effort to keep in touch, worth remembering. Um, there's a lovely comment here as well from Enda. It would be interesting to hear Tommy's perspective on those great questions he's asked for the panellists. Uh, don't worry, uh, Enda, we will have an opportunity uh, when Tommy sits on the panel in the future. Um, a lot of people here really asking some lovely questions and they're delighted with, with memories that are being brought back. Mark uh, is delighted that, that Phelan has mentioned um, that the team from 70 and 71, uh, and Mark is, is Leo's son, um, and that he was oh, the dead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, so he, they had the reunion recently and it really was a huge success. And what was lovely about it was uh, that uh, Ricky Devine could join us 
And actually, before he, he, he went to that reunion himself and John Milani actually visited the school, both of them started first year on the 7th of September, 1945. It's the most interesting cup of coffee I've, I've po- probably ever had. Uh, it was amazing to hear them uh, recall stories and how much uh, things have changed. Um, as well, it will be very important to, to note, uh, Niall, uh, Niall O'Connor mentions here about uh, his dad, and he really is appreciative of how highly people have spoken uh, of Brendan this evening. And I would like to echo those thoughts as well. Uh, he passed away in February uh, 2020, and we continue to remember Niall and, and Helen and, and all the gang there. Um, I suppose the one question that, that really uh, kind of stood out at the very start was, how would each of you define success? Um, I let you guys kick off and uh, I'll wrap it. I see there's a remark in there from uh, Jimmy Brown. Uh, if you guys are struggling in there uh, in first or second or third year, Jimmy Brown went on to become James Brown, head of NUIG in Galway. He was my prefect when I was at Chaw. Jimmy was in uh, sixth year, uh, came from Athlone. Uh, and he sort of went on to reach the stratosphere in terms of education. His brother was in my class, Ray Brown, like Jimmy, brilliant mathematician. And Ray is now down in Kerry. He's the Bishop of Kerry. Uh, And um, he was one of the vocations from our year. Uh, I met him three weeks ago, uh, looking hale and hearty. So what a success story you had in that Brown family. There were boarders. Uh, they got scholarships to Summerhill. So lads, how would you define success? Off with you. We'll start with the youngest. Who's the youngest? Not me. <laughs> I think, my, I think it has to be you, Gary. I think it's also a question for, for my brother, Connor. So uh, yeah, I think I, I should probably take it. And uh, I, I've, uh, yeah, I mean, how do you define success? It's such a, it's a, it's a broad, broad question. And yeah, when you're talking about success in leadership, success in, you know, academic success, ultimately it comes down to what I said at the top of the call. Success is remaining true to yourself. And I think that if I can get any message across to the students there today is always remain true to yourself, always remain present. You know, it, it's not how successful you've been from a materialistic point of view. It's, it's very much... Uh, you know, how you staying focused? Are you kind? Are you compassionate? Have you empathy? Are you tuned in? Those of us who are privileged enough to be in leadership positions and leading teams, you know, and driving and motivating and inspiring them. And really, you, you can only do that by being present, by being in tune, by having empathy, uh, by being uh, ultimately having uh, being an inspiration, being a good example. Uh, but then, all in all, I think you know, success is doing something you enjoy. I'm lucky; I enjoy what I do. Um, and from the perspective of if you do something you enjoy, you'll never work a day in your life. I think I'll, uh, that sums it up for me. Phelan? Yeah, and I suppose similar to that as well. Um, I think there is a huge emphasis on, on materialist, the materialist gains, I suppose, in life. Um, and, and a lot of the times, as far as I can see, success is measured in, in those terms or it's measured in your status in, in, in your work life or in your personal life. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to me to contentment. So if you have inner contentment, um, irrespective of the financial aspect or, or, or the, the, uh, your, your, your place in society or whatever it is, I think that's what success is to me. That um, if you strive for that, um, I think that will leave you far better off at the end of the day than striving for some of the other things that that we do strive for, unfortunately. Frank? Yeah, um, I've, I've moved from place to place and uh, at the end of each um, visit station of, of the cross of life, I, um, I always ask myself the one question, have I made a difference? Uh, and I think that's the, the biggest part. I don't know, am I still? Am I still coming through there? Just checking. Yeah. I, I, I think yeah. I may have frozen. Did I freeze, Tommy, or not? Well, or you just keep talking. Your sound is coming so, through. So what I think is um, make, making a difference is important. And I, I used to... Um, um, so I keep going and see what you can... 
No, maybe oh. I'll, I'll kick oh. on to, to Cormac while you're just refreshing there, Frank. Cormac, success? Yeah, Tommy, I listen. Again. Success. Uh, the, when, when, oh yeah, and come back to me because... because I don't... We're going to Cormac. Okay. Um, yeah, listen, as has already been mentioned, you know, success typically gets defined in, you know, materialistic ways, you know, how you've done in life. But, you know, I think if COVID has taught us nothing other than what is important in our lives. So I think everybody over the last two years have, ha, has had a, a reset in terms of what's important um, and what's important in their lives, whether it be community, whether it be family, et cetera. So like ultimately it's about being happy in what you're doing. Um, of course, everybody has to make a, make a decent living. You have to be able to put food on the table and that's important. And it's important to, to get to a standard of living that you, you would like to get to. But there comes a point in your life where, you know, money, it doesn't give you any more uh, happiness. It doesn't give you any more um, success. Uh, and ultimately, you have to be true to yourself. You have to enjoy what you're doing. Um, and I think that for all of us uh, uh, to reflect back on, you know, March, April 20, <coughs> 2020, when all of us got a hard lesson on what happiness is, is, is truly all about. And um, uh, certainly it's, uh, it, it's, it's not about material wealth. It's not about how much money you make, how big your house is, you've got to be happy with what you're doing. Do you want to have a cut at that again, Frank? I will, yeah, and I, I, if I'm repeating myself, sorry. What I, what I was saying is that success for me is what can I say at the end of, of a period in a, in a position? And uh, I've used the phrase in a few occasions, the rip wink. We're losing you again. Um, well, we are. I, I, just, I just want to say to you that um, Ruth Van um, Wink was the guy who went to sleep for a hundred years. We're yeah, Frank. Having, Frank, I'm, we're, I'm, I'm we're, we're, lo things. we're losing you there, Frank. We just yeah. just pause it for a tick. But uh, <laughs> I was just about to say that um, I remember I remember the day uh, one time in Summerhill during the break at. Um, it was the St. Patrick's weekend and Francis Rogers and myself went up to a Tin Lizzy gig in Roscommon, the Wagon Wheel, I think was the name of the place. And um, we were coming out, of, we stayed in the house of Joe Kearney, he was a boarder, uh, and had a bed and breakfast. And we were on our way to Mass, as one did, uh, on a Sunday, and Johnny Green spotted us. He was bringing his mother to Mass, he was a priest in Summerhill, and he came over and he offered us a ten shilling note. And we didn't take it, but that was Summerhill to me. Uh, roll the years on, I'm retired. And Mickey Yosh and his wife come out to my house with wine to mark my retirement. That was Summerhill for me. I know when um, uh, our young fella, I have a son called Joe, and Joe went to school in Ransborough, and the choice was, where is he going to go? And you had the grammar school up and running then. It wasn't just for girls in short skirts and, you know, their equivalents. There were Catholics going to uh, the grammar school at the time and didn't know where Joe wanted to go. In my heart of hearts, I wanted him to go to Summerhill. But the place was in an absolute mess. Remember, we went in to the parents' night. It was on in the gymnasium. And there was a car on fire in the car park. It was just, it was really, morale was at low and Tommy McManus was the principal who came in and he had been a boarder like his brother, Jimmy. And Tommy and the staff at that time took Summer Hill from the bottom of the pile and it rescued the place and it brought it up and it restored it. And my son went to that place and he has the same fondness uh, for Summer Hill as I have from it now. He has the very same kind of sense of the place uh, as I have now. And if I, was to, if I was to talk about success and the lesson that I learned from Summerhill, I was a slagger there. I couldn't fight with fellas with my fists, but I had a rough enough tongue. I could say hurtful things and call guys nicknames. Uh, and I suppose the lesson I learned going through it was try, to, and it's the lesson I've learned in life, is to try to cause as little hurt as possible. Try and do as much good as you can. Try and make as good of friends as you can. And if there's a fella in the place 
who you just notice he's been isolated or he's on the outside or there's something wrong with him. So Merhill is the place where that collective, where that sense of community, where that sense of belonging to a wider family, that's really a place where it becomes very, very important. That's my experience of Summerhill because they're such vital years. You'll never have a time like it in your life again where you're together with such a large community uh, for five years uh, and you'll never have the chance uh, to sort of bond with guys in a way like you can in Summerhill. And my idea of success would be to try and make the most of those years to be as good a friend to people as you can. Paul? Tommy, thanks a million. With that in mind, um, I want to try and, and play uh, our message from, from our head prefect. Apologies about the technical difficulties earlier on. We'll try and run it again. It's Eamon Feely, the head prefect. Hello, everyone. My name is Eamon Feely. I'm a Leaving Zer student and the current head prefect for Summerhill College this year. I'm from the Strand of the Road, and a lot of Feelys have gone through Summerhill College's doors. I don't know how many there is to count but I've heard countless stories from teachers and past pupils. It's an honour to be able to talk to you all today as part of a Realising Our Potential series. Some of the alumni have traversed the globe, ranging from places like New York, London, Singapore and Australia. They've achieved a great number of things in their own dedicated fields on a national and international level. As the alumni programme has grown exponentially this year, we are able to grasp the achievements of past pupils which raises the aspiration of our current students while heightening what is possible for all Summer Hill students in Sligo, if they have the same commitment, dedication and determination as our past pupils. Summer Hill has constantly evolved since the origin in Athlone. We now have a state-of-the-art building across the road from the old building where thousands of students walk through those doors. We have over 25 nationalities and languages present in the building now. And with student numbers on the rise, there are future developments coming to the school, like the new student hub and pitches and then the extensions on the current building. Summer Hill is a school like no other. I have loved my time here. The connection management holds a student body cannot be replicated. They listen to our points on issues in the school. And other areas that we are doing very well on is the wide range of sporting facilities we offer and the link between teachers and students, not only management. Summerhill offers a very unique experience. The most important lesson I have learned since first year here is get involved and try. I mean, take part in everything. And if you fail it, it doesn't matter. Try again. Everything is a learning curve. But we won't know what it's like if we don't try and take part. I have so many positive memories from my time here whether it be the crack with the teachers and students or the TY musical. We've all been given lots of opportunities to realise our potential, whether it be in academic or sporting. There are so many avenues for you to improve while you're here. Finally, I look forward to being an alumnus myself one day, and I hope I'll be able to inspire future Summerhill students on their individual journeys. The strong-knit Summerhill community, I feel, is the best asset the school has. Thank you all for listening to me today and taking the time to share your experiences with us. So a huge thank you to Eamon. And on behalf well of... Well done you. Well done you. Um, that was great. On behalf of the entire uh, Summerhill community, those who have joined us on the call, a huge thank you for, to this evening's panel. We are very grateful to Cormac, Phelan, Frank, Gary and Tommy for such an informative session and a really, really, really good chat. Um, I would like to everyone who's uh, thank everyone who's joined us online, and I would ask you please keep in touch. Join the alumni association with the, which we give regular updates. Send us in some photographs and articles, or some class news, or maybe some information about the past for our next newsletter, which is due out by the end of November. Share tonight's recording, um, as we will send out a recording of it uh, to those who to have who have joined, and we'll also forward it to, to those on our alumni list, so that people get the opportunity to really uh, hear the most, I suppose, informative and inspiring conversation that has taken place this evening. So again, thank you to all who've took part and to all who've attended, and we look forward to, to, to seeing you again in the future. Thank you, Paul. And on behalf of the guys, um, it was an honor uh, to take part in this. And uh, my parting shot to you is, if ever you think you've got a crisis in the place, Paul, or if you think things are going wrong, we've known worse, okay? <laughs> All the best. <laughs>
Thanks, Tommy. And thanks again, everybody. Thanks so much. Good night. God bless. Right. Enjoy care. your breakfast, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Bye.